I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. issue of this war is the basic issue between those who believe in mankind and those who do not. The ancient issue between those who put their faith in the people and those who put their faith in dictators and tyrants. There have always been those who did not believe in the people who attempted to block their forward movement across history, to force them back to servility and suffering and silence. People have now gathered their strength. They are moving forward in their might and power. And no force, no combination of forces, no trickery, deceit or violence can stop them now. They see before them the hope of the world, a decent, secure, peaceful life for men everywhere.
peace can endure only so long as humanity really insists upon it and is willing to work for it and sacrifice for it. 25 years ago, American fighting men looked to the statesmen of the world to furnish the work of peace for which they fought and suffered. We failed them. We failed them then, we cannot fail them again and expect the world to survive again. Let us, all of us, have confidence. Let us redouble our effort. A tremendous, costly, long enduring task in peace as well as in war is still ahead of us. But as we face that continuing task, we may know that the state of this nation is good. The heart of this nation is sound. The spirit of this nation is strong. The faith of this nation is eternal. to the armed forces of the United States throughout the world. After the tragic news of the death of our late Commander-in-Chief, it was my duty to speak promptly to the Congress and the armed forces of the United States. A few days ago, I addressed the Congress. Now I speak to you. I am especially anxious to talk to you, for I know that all of you felt a tremendous shock as we did at home when our Commander-in-Chief fell. All of us have lost a great leader, a far-sighted statesman, and a real friend of democracy. You have lost a hard-hitting chief and an old friend of the services. Our hearts are heavy. However, the cause which claimed Roosevelt also claims us. He never faltered, nor will we. I have done as you do in the field when the commander falls. My duties and responsibilities are clear. I have assumed them. 
These duties will be carried on in keeping with our American tradition. As a veteran of the First World War, I have seen death on the battlefield. When I fought in France with the 35th Division, I saw good officers and men fall and be replaced. I know that this is also true of the officers and men of the other services, the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marine. I know the strain, the mud, the misery, and the utter weariness of the soldier in the field. And I know, too, his courage, his stamina, and his faith in his comrades, his country, and himself. We are depending upon each and every one of you. Recently, I said to the Congress, and I repeat it now, our debt to the heroic men and valiant women in the services of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. Because of these sacrifices, the dawn of justice and freedom throughout the world slowly casts its gleam across the horizon. At this decisive hour of history, it is very difficult to express my feelings. Words will not convey what is in my heart. Yet, I recall the words of Lincoln, a man who had enough eloquence to speak for all America. To indicate my sentiments and to describe my hope for the future, may I quote the immortal words of that truly great commander-in-chief. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. The day following President Roosevelt's funeral, President Truman receives an ovation in the House as he asks help of Congress and the nation in the grave task ahead. He tells us that the high command will be unhampered and with great humility pays his tribute to our lost leader. It is with a heavy heart that I stand before you, my friends and colleagues in the Congress of the United States. Only yesterday, we laid to rest the mortal remains of our beloved president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. At a time like this, words are inadequate. The most eloquent tribute would be a reverent silence. Yet in this decisive hour, when world events are moving so rapidly, our silence might be misunderstood and might give comfort to our enemies. With great humility, I call upon all Americans to help me keep our nation united in defense of those ideals which have been so eloquently proclaimed by Franklin Roosevelt. I want in turn to assure my fellow Americans and all of those who love peace and liberty throughout the world that I will support and defend those ideals with all my strength and all my heart. That is my duty, and I shall not shirk it. So that there can be no possible misunderstanding, both Germany and Japan can be certain, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that America will continue the fight for freedom until no vestige of resistance remains. Our 
Royal Command has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. We will face the problems of peace with the same courage that we have faced and mastered the problems of war. In the memory of those who have made the supreme sacrifice, in the memory of our fallen president, we shall not fail. Leaving Blair House to take up official residence at the executive mansion, the new president of the United States, Harry S. Truman, begins a busy day. Entering the White House executive offices, he embarks upon one of the toughest jobs on earth, winning the final victory and securing the peace. Matthew J. Connolly, confidential secretary, will continue to aid Mr. Truman in the mighty task ahead. James Leonard Wrench handles press, newsreels, and radio for the White House. <music> President Truman's first major function was the appointment of John W. Snyder as director of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Next on the presidential schedule was the meeting with the United States delegates to the San Francisco Conference. Following President Roosevelt's example, Mr. Truman welcomes reporters to the biggest press conference ever assembled in the White House, and later signs a bill extending Lend-Lease to our allies. Mm -hmm. 